is so glad that you're here, whoever you are, if you're new. Sometimes when you're new to a place, you're sitting there going like, what are these people doing? They all know each other. We're so glad, whoever you are that's here and you're new, we're so glad you're here. Wherever you're at in your journey with God, you know, what we do here on Wednesday nights, we don't really do sermons, we're, we study through the Bible. So we're, we, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and Wednesday night we're in what we call the Old Testament. Sunday mornings we do verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the New Testament. But the Old Testament, just so you have some context before we jump into where we left off in Daniel chapter nine, the Old Testament is the record of a people that God raised up. He chose them. And what it means is that he chose that through them he's going to bring his light and salvation to the entire world, to you and me. He, he, he had to choose somebody to bring it through. And he chose these people. He started with a guy named Abraham. Abraham was from a region that is modern day southern Iraq the Ur of the Chaldeans. And he called him to, and he gave him a land, he gave him offspring, he said, I'm gonna make your name great. He said, through you, or in you, Abraham, all families of the earth will be blessed. This was God's intention from the outset, was to bring blessing to the entire world, to bring blessing to every language, nation, tribe, and people, every ethnicity and color of skin. God so loves the world. This is the story we see. And what we've been seeing is that these people that he raised up, they're just as messed up as you are. They're just as messed up as I am. They're in need of the very salvation that God's gonna bring through them to the world, and the whole Old Testament, it flows to, it towards Jesus. Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah. The very first words of the New Testament, Matthew chapter one, verse one. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, and Jesus is for the world. He's for everybody. It's through these people. And so we see that they fail. They need salvation just like I do, just like you do. But the other theme that we see going through the Old Testament is that God is faithful. And even though they're messed up, they're as messed up as you are. They're as messed up as I am. God won't let them go. And God will fulfill what he promised to do through them for the world, for me and you. Just like God's working in your life, he started a work in your life. And you're messed up. You're not, you haven't arrived. You've got issues, you've got struggles. God's gonna fulfill the purpose for which he called you. He will not let you go. He'll spank you at times, like a good father spanks his kids, like a good mother spanks her children, disciplines her children. God will spank you, but he won't let you go. He will be faithful to finish, the scripture says, what he started in you. He will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. The work that he began in you, he will complete it until the day of Christ. Well, we're at this point now that we're in the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. We're in a place in the history of these people. God had been warning them for decades through Jeremiah, through Isaiah, through the different prophets. He'd been warning these people, his people, because they'd turned their back on him. They turned and made idols for themselves. And God had been warning them that he was gonna take them to the woodshed. He was gonna discipline them. He was gonna remove them from the land that he gave them forever and spank them in Babylon. 
And then he'd bring him back after he cleaned his house out. Okay? We saw last time in the first half of chapter 9, Daniel is in this exile that God had warned would happen. He is there. He's been carried away as a captive into Babylon. He's 85 years old by this time. When he was taken captive, he was only 15 years old or so. And as this old man now in Babylon, he's been serving these various kings because he was gifted. He, the Bible says he was, a, he was beautiful in appearance, that he was brilliant, like a high IQ. He was one of those type of guys. You know, in Babylon, when they had taken the Jewish people captive and carried them away, they, said, they, t they, they saw some of the youngsters and said, we're going to train these guys and we're going to use them for our benefit in the kingdom. Well, Daniel has served through many kings by this time. And he's been reading the book of Jeremiah. He has the scroll of Jeremiah. That, and Jeremiah had prophesied some 70, 80, 90 years ago, back before this deportation, before the exile. Well, as an old man now, Daniel, this, he's now serving under the king of the Medes because the Medes and the Persians now have risen to world dominance. And Babylon now has faded out. And the Medes saw him and said, we're going to keep this kid. He's an old, he was an older man by then because he was so talented and he was such a benefit to the kingdom, and Daniel, there in Babylon, there he is reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he's seeing the stuff that Jeremiah said, that he's, he's remembering that Jeremiah warned there would be 70 years. Jeremiah said it specifically. The spanking is going to last 70 years. The exile is going to last 70 years. And then God is going to bring his people back and he's going to finish what he started in them and through them for the entire world. Okay, so Daniel's there reading Jeremiah and he's realizing 70 years. I've been here. He, he, Daniel was deported in the first wave of deportations. He's sitting there with his little Babylonian bead calculator, and he's realizing it's, seven, it's 70 years, it's coming right now. He's, and he's so moved as he's reading the scripture and he's realizing what the prophets said, it's right here, right upon us. We're going to be returning. I don't know how, but God's going to do something, and we're going to be going back to the land that God has given us. And so Daniel, as we saw last time we were together, he began to pray. He was so moved by these prophecies in Scripture that he began to pray. And it was a very passionate prayer we saw. And we left off in verse 20 of chapter 9. And he said, now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, he was, I said, I was praying for the holy mountain of my God, which speaks of Mount Zion, where the temple mount is in Jerusalem. He says, I was there praying. Oh, God, you're gonna bring us back. But he, we saw this passionate prayer, and he said, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, this, was, this is actually the angel Gabriel, who angels can appear as humans. You know, in the New Testament, we're told, be careful how you entertain strangers because some have entertained strangers, or angels without realizing it, okay? So Daniel says here, as I was in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, he reached me about the time of the evening sacrifice. Daniel realized he even though he'd been gone out of Jerusalem and the temple has been destroyed now for 70 years, he always was thinking of the timing of the worship back in the temple in Jerusalem. And he says it was about the time of the evening sacrifice back in the homeland that Gabriel appeared to me as I was praying. 
and he informed me, verse 22, and he talked to me and he said, oh, Daniel. Now, whenever there's an O before the name, it means a deep, deep endearment. Oh, Daniel. It's so filled with love. It's so filled with tenderness. Oh, Daniel. It's not just, hey, Daniel. Gabriel appeared to me as I was praying. It was at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, when you began to really pray, as you were touched by the scripture, as you realized the prophecy said 70 years and you had your calculator out and you're like, 70 years, that's now. He says, when you began to pray, the command went out. God dispatched me to come towards you and to you and I have come to you. Notice, for you, Daniel, are greatly beloved. Gosh, I love that. You know why I love that especially? Because this is how God feels about you. This is how God feels about his people. This is how he feels about his people. He loves you. He looks at you and he says, you are my beloved. There's too many scriptures in the New Testament that call us beloved beloved to go into. You can Google it look them all up, meditate on it, but that's how God sees you. He doesn't see you as some idiot that he's ready to slap upside the head. He's not thinking, you stupid moron. He's not condemning you. He's saying your name with an O before it. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Esther. You know? You are, I've come, I've come, I was dispatched when you began to pray because you are greatly beloved. You are greatly beloved. God wants you to know that because that's who you are. That's your fundamental identity as given to you by God is you are loved by God. You know, in the New Testament, John, John was one of the apostles he wrote the Gospel of John, right? Well, when you read the Gospel of John, he's describing all these things that he was eyewitness to. All the characters that he saw interacting with Jesus, all the things and the people Jesus ministers to, and he's calling them all by name, but whenever John refers to himself in his own Gospel, you know how he refers to himself? He would say, and then the disciple that Jesus loves did such and such, or said this or that. Why does he do that? Because that's who he he knows now that he is. This is who he realizes, this is what I am, this is who I am. And do you know that that's your identity? As given by God? Your parents gave you a name. My parents gave me the name Gregory, which means watchful one. You know, like I'm always watching out or something. The devil gives me a name. He calls me an idiot, a hopeless case. But God has given me my true identity. And you find this when you come to Christ. You are beloved of God. That's who you are. And John was just walking in it. He's like, when he referred to himself, he's like, and then the disciple that Jesus loves. You know, God wants you to get to that place where you wake up in the morning painfully aware of your shortcomings and your failures, and yet you realize that deeper than all of that, your fundamental identity is, I am beloved of God. That's where God's bringing you. That's step one, actually. And he wants you to walk through the day realizing his favor is upon you because he loves you that much. That's the gospel. That's the good news. is that we are beloved of God. John says, John, the same John, in 1 John, he said, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. There's something deep in there. John chapter 
First John chapter three, verse one and two, he says, check this out. That's what behold means, you know, check this out. What in the word is actually species. What species of love is this? That we, he's, because he knows who, he knows the sinfulness. He knows the imperfections. He knows this, the issues he has. He says, what kind of love is this that we, have been called sons and daughters of God. And he says in the next verse, this is what we are. Because God says it. He, he, John was walking in this. He was living in this. He was living off of what God said, who God says he is, not who anybody else says he is, or what the devil says he is, but what God says he is. And he's blown away. And we are, I'm blown away that God would look at me and go, you're my beloved. Why am I blown away? Because I know more than any of you or even my wife what a wretch I can be. The struggles I have in my flesh. And yet God in Christ has declared, you're my beloved. And here God shows up to Daniel. The angel Gabriel is sent to him. He says, oh, Daniel. You are greatly beloved. You're so beloved of God. He says, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. So Gabriel says, Daniel, consider this matter, understand this vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, the Jewish people, Israel, Remember, these are the people through whom God is bringing salvation to the entire world. He says, listen, and this is a key verse in this chapter, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city. Speaking of Jerusalem. Okay, Daniel's in Babylon. He's in exile. He's, he's part of the spanking that these people are experiencing but Gabriel appears and says, listen and understand this. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now Daniel had just considered a set of sevens upon the nation of Israel when he figured that Jeremiah said 70 years. There's 10 units of seven. We're gonna be in X, and he realizes we're right there. We're in the 69th year, whatever it was. And it's as if God is now saying through Gabriel, I'm gonna now show you some sevens that are gonna blow your mind. You think that that was amazing, that you just discovered that you're right at the end of the 70 year spanking? Let me give you some more sevens here. 70 weeks are determined for your people, people of Israel, and your holy city. Now in the ancient Hebrew, the word weeks, it simply refers to a unit of sevens, okay? We think of weeks and months and years, right? Even in Hungarian, we lived in Hungary for 17 years, I speak Hungarian. The word seven is the word hate, H-E-T, not hate, H-A-T-E, but hate. Ed kept you harem. Nyot, ert, hot, hate, hate. Okay, the word for week, like in weeks, months, years, is the word hate. Seven. I'll be there in, in, a, in, next, in the next, next set of sevens. I'll be there next week. It's the same word. Okay, the word here in Hebrew is often used to mean a unit of seven days, but it is also used in Scripture to mean a unit of seven years. It just means a unit of seven, okay? And you can look in Genesis 29, starting in verse 15, read there, and you'll see an example of using this ancient Hebrew word for both seven days and seven years, all in the same context, okay? And so for your people, and for your holy city, Daniel, Gabriel the angel is telling him, there's, there's 70 weeks. There's 70 weeks or 70 weeks of years is what he's speaking here 
where the focus is gonna be upon Israel and the city of Jerusalem. These 70 weeks are God's calendar for Israel in the sense that during these weeks of years, the focus is on Israel and it's not on the Gentiles or on the church, it's on Israel, okay? And what will be accomplished in these 70 weeks of years, which is 490 years, right? 70 weeks of years, 70 times seven, 490. What will be accomplished? He says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to finish off all the prophecies, and to anoint the most holy, to bring in the king and the kingdom of God. To finish transgression means the establishment of an entirely new order on earth with an end to man's rebellion against God. This would require nothing less than the inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth. To make an end of sins, notice. This not, is not only the end of the guilt of sin, which happened on the cross of Christ, but this is an end to sin entirely. You know that in the new heavens and the new earth, we will not struggle with sin anymore? We have been in Christ, I've been forgiven the penalty of sin forever. As I learn to walk in the spirit, I can be free from the power of sin only as I walk in the spirit. I can't overcome it in my own energy. But the day that's coming, the very presence of sin will be removed forever. The penalty is gone. The power has been broken if we walk in the spirit. And the presence of sin will be removed forever. And so here he says, there's 70 weeks of years determined upon Israel and the holy city until all of these things are accomplished. To make an end of sins, notice next, to make reconciliation for iniquity. This work was clearly accomplished. It was inaugurated at the cross of Jesus Christ, but it will be culminated when he returns and will be in our new bodies. To bring in everlasting righteousness, notice there, this means a new order of society that will come when Jesus comes again and finishes everything that he has started in this world, okay? To seal up vision and prophecy when all prophecy will have been fulfilled. So many prophecies have been fulfilled and yet there's still more to be fulfilled and this is speaking about this time, this when all prophecy will have been completely fulfilled, including the concluding of the final stage of human history and to anoint the most holy, notice. So the culminating and the enthroning and the reigning of Jesus Christ. Finally, there'll be a king who reigns in righteousness. Finally, there'll be a politician that will be everybody will be satisfied with. You know, all of our politicians now promise and they all disappoint. And then the next guys all promise and then they disappoint. And we're all divided over politics. Well, there's coming a king. The government will rest upon his shoulders and we will go, this is the one we've been waiting for. Everybody will be blessed. Nobody will be oppressed. There will be righteous truth and, right, and, and righteousness for all, right? Truth and justice for all. This is what we aspire to. But we haven't arrived yet. It will happen when he comes. So taken as a whole, Gabriel made a remarkable announcement here to Daniel. Okay? Each of these amazing things will happen within a period of 70 weeks of years. Okay? Now next... Daniel explains the course and the dividing of these 70 years. This is an important point. Gabriel will hear next in verse 25, he will show us that the 70 weeks of years are not entirely consecutive, okay? 
but there's a total of 70 weeks of years that the focus will be on Israel. And he's hundreds of years here before Christ. But not, these years will not all be consecutive. There's gonna be a break in, the, in, in, in this outplaying, okay? Notice he says, therefore know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, take a good look at that verse, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, okay, Judah is in Babylon in exile. Jerusalem's destroyed. The temple has been completely demolished. Gabriel's telling Daniel the starting point of these 70 weeks, when these 70 weeks will begin, it starts when there goes forth a command, a decree is made that Jerusalem is to be rebuilt, that the people are to return back and rebuild the walls and the streets of Jerusalem. There's, he said, therefore understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So there'll be 69 of these 70 weeks that will transpire. Then Messiah the Prince will come, but then there's one week left. Where's this next week? We'll talk about that in a minute. There's still a week that's hanging out there, okay? So there's this Gabriel's telling Daniel the starting point for the 70 weeks of prophecy is when there's this command to restore and rebuild. That's the specific starting point of these 70 weeks. And it's interesting to consider the present controversy. The whole world is swept up in this controversy right now today. It's the biggest news in the world over the land of Israel and the accusation that the Jewish people are colonizers in the land. It's interesting how many decrees have been made, listen, by Persian kings. How many decrees during the time of Daniel were made by Persian kings? 600 years before Christ. And this is something that needs to be talked about. These decrees that were made by Persian kings, Persia is where modern day Iran is, okay? The, king, the, the, the ancient kings that ruled it, where modern day Iran is now made these decrees and according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, what those ancient kings decreed was irrevocable. It could not be altered. It could not be changed according to their own laws. It's amazing how many decrees were made by these Persian kings concerning the Jewish people, the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple. Cyrus, king of Persia, made a decree where he gave Ezra and and the, and the Babylonian captives the right to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. You can read about this in Ezra chapter one, verse one through four. Darius, who was another king, a Mede, a Mede king, the Medes and the Persians, he made a decree giving Ezra the right to rebuild the temple. This is an acknowledgement that that's your land that city belongs to you and your temple is where you worship your God. You can read that in Ezra chapter six, verse six. Then another king, Artaxerxes, made a decree giving Ezra permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and this was in 458 BC. And you can read about this decree of Artaxerxes the king there of Persia. Artaxerxes made a decree giving Nehemiah permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the walls. Okay, there's Nehemiah chapter two, verse one through eight. And this is the one, this is the 
proclamation that Gabriel is telling Daniel is the starting point because Artaxerxes, the decree he made to give Nehemiah permission, permits, materials, safe passage to go back and rebuild the walls, this is the one that Daniel said when, when this decree goes forth, there's the beginning of these 70 weeks of years, okay? The first three that I talked about from Cyrus and Darius and the first decree of Artaxerxes, these were all concerning the temple, you know, they were focused on the temple, but the one that Artaxerxes made and gave Nehemiah passage was to go back and rebuild the streets and the walls, to rebuild the city, and that's what Gabriel said to Daniel, when from the going forth of the decree to rebuild the city, not the temple, but the city, the 70 week timetable begins, okay? By the decree that he made, Artaxerxes made in 445 before Christ is the one Daniel's referring to here. God, Gabriel revealed that from the going forth of the command again, to restore and build Jerusalem. Listen, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What's seven plus 62? Right, you got your little calculator up in your brain? 69. So there's 69 of the seven weeks. Now follow this, and you can, I'm gonna give you reference to a, a book that was written by an amazing guy, Sir Robert Anderson, who was one of the investigators at Scot in Scotland Yard, a brilliant man. He, he calculated all of this out and did all this historical research. But sixty nine of these weeks will will transpire, and then Messiah will come. God said through Daniel the exact day that Israel's Messiah would be presented to the nation of Israel. Okay, now follow this. And then there were still seven years hanging. And we'll talk about that. Remember, these are Persian kings acknowledging that the land, the city of Jerusalem, the temple, all belong to the Jewish people. This is the controversy today. Modern-day Iran are the ones that deny the history, the archaeology, everything in the ground in Israel is Jewish, everything. I've been there eight times. Anywhere you start digging down, you find something that collaborates what we find in the Bible. Everything. Everything that you read in your Bible, you can go to Israel and dig it up and, and, and see it from synagogues, exactly where it says the synagogues were. I've stood on the southern steps of the temple where Jesus walked up. He walked on those steps that we sat on. I walked down the Mount of Olives. They've excavated in the last 15, 20 years the city of David and found artifacts. You know, we read these stories about David up on his rooftop and he's seeing Bathsheba. They've dug up the city of David with the walls and artifacts. That was where it was. There's where David stood and he saw her bathing and he got in a lot of trouble. And there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands. It, there, it, it's, it's a mind blower. The, the, the land of Israel is like one big time capsule. <laughs> you know, they have these things, they call them tells. You're driving through Israel and you're seeing these things, they look like hills. Those are cities that are buried and they haven't gotten to hundreds of them yet. But everyone they dig up affirms. They found Solomon's stables. They found everything that you can imagine that's in the Bible. But these modern day Iranian, and I, want to, I always need to distinguish between these mullahs, these radicals, that have the Iranian people captive, they literally are holding their people captive. They want, all the people want out. <laughs> the, the, the Persian people are beautiful, they are unbelievably talented, and they're being held back. 
And did you know that the biggest Christian movement in the world right now, the biggest Christian movement in the world is in Iran. And it's being led by the women. The underground church in Iran, there's hundreds of thousands of Iranians coming to Christ and they have to meet in secret because they'll be killed or thrown in prison because of their faith. But modern day Iran are the ones that are behind these attacks on Israel. They're funding Hezbollah and Hamas and these groups and they're denying the clear history they're denying the archaeology. Listen, and this is the point, and the reason I bring it up tonight in Daniel chapter nine, they're denying what their own kings decreed about these people and whose land this is and their right to return and their right to build their temple and worship God there. They're denying the, what, the law of the Medes and the Persians that is irrevocable. <laughs> it's amazing from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69 weeks. Gabriel's message to Daniel was simple and striking. In simple terms, six, seven, seven weeks and 62 is 483 years. Just do the, the math. Seven, you know, plus 69 times seven, it's 483 years. And then Messiah will be here. The Prince, Messiah the Prince. Now Sir Robert Anderson of the Scotland Yard in the 1800s, here's the book, we have it in the bookstore, you can get this. In his, this is, a, this is an amazing, he did so much research and he was a brilliant guy working for Scotland Yard, it's like our CIA in Britain, right? He shows that these 483 years were completed to the day when Jesus came in with what we call the triumphal entry. He presented himself as the Messiah. Remember that? He came down the Mount of Olives on a donkey and the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the Pharisees said, tell them to be quiet, and Jesus said, if they be quiet, the very rocks will cry out, because this is the day, and it was to the very day, and you can do the, do the, the deeper research, get this book and check it out if you're interested, but he shows using the 360 day year, which is what Israel used in Daniel's day, he calculated 173,880 days from the decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem that Jesus, that's when Jesus came in and was presented as Messiah the Prince to Israel, okay? The prophecy is so specifically fulfilled that it has been a significant testimony to many. John Trapp, who's a Bible commentator in the 1600s, he said, others of the Jewish scholars, by evidence of these words, have been compelled to confess that Messiah is already come, and that he was that Jesus whom their forefathers crucified. John Trapp said in his day, in the 1600s, that people looking at these prophecies Jews looking said the Messiah has had to have already come because of this, this, the seven weeks plus the 62, the 69. It's, and it happened exactly when Jesus came. <laughs> you know, Many Jewish scholars, he said, John Trapp says in the 1600s have been compelled to say it had to have been him. It had to have been him. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. This indicates that the rebuilding of the streets and the walls of Jerusalem would happen in the first seven weeks mentioned and then would follow, there would follow another 62 weeks until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. Okay, so let's, this is, I always hated word, these mathematical word problems in high school, <laughs> you know. 
John's driving 60 miles an hour and the car going past him is going 30 and he went for two hours and this guy, and then how far did he travel? I, was, I always hated those word problems. Okay, but these 70 weeks are divided into three parts just to summarize. Okay, seven weeks, 49 years until the city and the walls have been rebuilt and that happened through Ezra and Nehemiah right then, right after Daniel heard this, and then 69 weeks, seven plus 62, that 483 years from the decree of Artaxerxes until the Messiah, the Prince, appears, and yet there's this seventh week, there's this 70th week, excuse me, that's still hanging there. What happens after the 69 weeks when the Messiah, the Prince, is presented, Verse 26, he says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He's gonna come exactly 483 years from now, and that's exactly when Jesus came, and Daniel said, and then after he's presented, he'll be cut off. He's gonna die, but not for himself, okay? The biblical term cut off is used to describe execution, put to death. Gabriel told Daniel the Messiah will be cut off for the sake of others, not for himself. Jesus was crucified immediately after these 483 years. He was the triumphal entry, he was right there. It was just days before the cross and he was cut off, okay? He was cut off but not for himself. He died for you. He died for our sake. When he died, he took away all that sin that you struggle with, and you have now been forever freed from the penalty of sin. It's already done. You will never pay for your sin. He paid for all of it. You will never pay for the sin that you presently struggle with. One day, all the very presence of sin is gonna be removed. That's the day we long for. But right now, he calls you to walk in that forgiveness, okay? And the people of the prince who is to come, notice this, this is a different prince. There's Prince the Messiah, who came 483 years and then was cut off, but not for his own self, but for us. And it says, but the people of the prince who is to come, so this is another prince, another ruling person. He shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it will be with the flood. Notice this. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so there's Messiah the prince, and then there's this prince to come. Two different people. The second one is a destroyer. The first one lays his life down, not for him. He gets cut off, not because of himself, but for you for me, this next one, the prince who is to come, is a destroyer, he's a blasphemer. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after Messiah the prince is cut off, Jerusalem and her temple will be destroyed again is what Daniel's saying, by an overwhelming flood, an army. In AD 70, Titus of Rome, of Rome, came in just after Jesus was crucified. Titus of Rome came in and ransacked Jerusalem. The, whole, the walls were all broken down, the temple was destroyed and most of the Jewish population was scattered again. Most of them. Do you know that not all of them were scattered? There's been a continuous presence of Jewish people in that land all along. But most of them were scattered. The destroying army were made up of the people of the prince, this prince who's yet to come. Okay? This coming prince is described more in, de- in chapter in verse 27. Then he will confirm a covenant 
with many for one week. There's that hanging week, right? There's that 70th week. But in the middle of that week, so there's this, there's this next prince who's coming, and it was the people of the prince that destroyed things in 70 AD, the Romans, so the Antichrist is gonna be somehow connected with Roman heritage, okay? And he's gonna confirm a covenant with many, with many of the people of Israel. Not everybody's gonna be on board with this, but most of Israel will be drawn in with, to this guy. He's gonna make this covenant f for one week, for seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years into this peace treaty that this guy makes, do you think Israel needs a peace treaty with the people around Israel? Everyone around Israel wants to destroy Israel today, right now. Do you think they need someone to come up and say, we're gonna make a peace treaty here? Well, there's coming one. There's a prince to come who'll be somehow related to the ones who destroyed in 70 AD. He will come and make a covenant. And in the middle of the seven-year peace treaty, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. He, notice, he will confirm a covenant with many. In, this is speaking many in Israel, okay? Now if we know who the prince's people are who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, we, then we know that this coming prince has ancestral roots in the soil of the ancient Roman Empire. I don't claim to understand all this. I see what it says, and you know, there's all sorts of people that make all sorts of speculations. I don't like to do that, okay? But it's somehow gonna be connected to, to, to ancient Rome but it seems that therefore the prince who is to come will in some way be heir to the Roman world, even as the final world government is an heir to the Roman Empire, as we saw in Daniel chapter seven in the, in the dream he saw there. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Notice again that phrase. He will make this covenant with Israel for this final unit of seven that still hangs and thus completing the 70 weeks that were prophesied concerning the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. The covenant is with many. The literal Hebrew says covenant with the many, referring to most of the Jewish people. Just saying, we, we want in on this. We want this peace right now, <laughs> you know? And, and they do, they want peace. They just want peace. With this covenant, it seems to indicate most in Israel will embrace this one who is later defined in other places in scripture as the Antichrist, okay? Taking the description of what would be accomplished in the 70 weeks from verse 24, we know that the 70 weeks are not yet complete in our day. 69 have been. The Messiah came on the exact day of the 69th week, there's these, seven, there's these seven years that still hang. The events promised in the first 69 weeks are fulfilled, indicating that there's this lengthy pause in the 70 weeks, between the 69th and the 70th. The 70th week will begin when the prince who is to come, the Antichrist, confirms a covenant with the Jewish people and at that time the temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices will start again. Okay, now if you, <laughs> there's been no sacrifice in Israel since Christ died on the cross because he fulfilled it and the whole thing was shut down, the thing was destroyed, the people were scattered. And when you look at this and you say how in the, you know the hottest piece of real estate on planet Earth is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There is more spiritual warfare over that 
piece of real estate. The Al-Aqsa Mosque is up there. But that's where the temple stood. Solomon's temple stood there. The temple that Ezra rebuilt in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was there. All the archaeology shows it. Do you know that the Muslim Council in, 19, in the 1920s, they wrote in their little council decree that the Temple Mount is where Israel's temple stood, that it's undeniably the place where David offered his sacrifice to the Lord and Solomon built the temple. Now that Israel has prospered so much, they're not, they, they want to kind of bury what they said, what they wrote, and you can find, you can find that decree that's only 100 years old. But they said it's undeniable that this is the place where Israel worshiped their God. This is where the temple stood, and the archaeology is clear on this, okay? But in the middle of this week, the temple's gonna be rebuilt. I've always thought, like, it, this is the most impossible, the most humanly impossible situation in the history of the world is this situation there in Israel. And there's two sides to this story, hu humanly speaking, okay? Because there are, there are people that were there and that have been displaced. There, it's a total mess. I look at it, I'm like going, this is, no human being could solve this, but there's coming a prince. There's a coming prince who's gonna somehow pull off a peace treaty. You know, a lot of people were speculating Donald Trump is the Antichrist, you know, because at the last year of his term, he's, he, he, he uh, made this, these Abraham Accords where he started to have, there was peace treaties between Israel and Saudi Arabia and all these Arab nations around. Israel already has peace with Jordan and with Egypt that they've had for years and years and years. But to bring Saudi Arabia on board? And you know that it wasn't even Trump's idea, it was Netanyahu's idea that it took him three years to talk Trump into. Saying, and, and yet Donald Trump takes glory for everything, right? <laughs> but at least he, 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 he went for it, you know? And this thing that's happening right now, this attack, is because Iran doesn't want Saudi Arabia and Israel's neighbors to make peace with them because they hate each other. <laughs> Saudi Arabia hates Iran because Iran wants to dominate and control the whole region and Saudi Arabia's like going, you're not gonna dominate us. And you know what's interesting is that in the middle of this whole thing, Saudi Arabia has said, once this thing is over in Gaza, we're gonna continue with the peace with Israel, which kind of blows my mind. Because I was like thinking, this is it, guys, this is it. <laughs> All the nations around, they're ready to completely destroy, and maybe this isn't it. Maybe this is like a foretaste of this coming time when it is it. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of this final seven years, three and a half years in, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering. This coming prince will break the covenant with Israel in the middle of the seven years. The book of Revelation speaks of this coming seven year period. You can read about it in Revelation 12, 13, 14, and 15. On the wings of the abomination shall one be one who makes desolate. In Hebrew, this idea of abominations is gross, radical idolatry. This coming prince, who's called the Antichrist, in the middle of this peace, this seven year peace treaty, he's gonna break it. He's gonna put an end to the sacrifices that Israel has reinstated, and he's gonna, he's gonna desecrate the newly built temple. Jesus called this the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15, you can look that up. But, and he indicated, Jesus indicated that that was gonna be the pivotal moment in this last seven year period that's called, that's been also called the Great Tribulation. In the middle of it, all hell is gonna break loose. And this guy's gonna stand in the holy 
place in this temple and he's gonna declare himself to be God, <laughs> okay? And this is when all hell breaks loose. These, is, these are huge topics that we could take months and months to develop. But if you wanna dive deeper into what is covered in this chapter, this is the deep dive. This was just a, this was a flyover at 35,000 feet. This was the quick look. But this is the deep dive, sir. Sir Robert Anderson's work on these prophecies and all the history and the exact day Messiah the Prince came and then he was cut off. And then it, these seven weeks in this coming Prince, he covers all of this in this book, but that's enough for one night. God, we thank you for your word, it's amazing. We pray, God, that you would give us wisdom as the whole world is revolving around this land, this city, these people, the beautiful Iranian people with these ancient decrees that came out of that land. <laughs> this is mind-blowing how relevant all this is. And I don't claim to fully grasp all of it or understand it all clearly, but this is too much, Lord. It's too obvious that you knew all this was happening. We pray, God, as believers in Israel's Messiah who came for everybody, that you would give us a heart for everybody, for Gazans and Palestinians and Jordanians and Egyptians and Syrians and Iranians and Iraqis, Father, for Europeans and Asians and Africans and Americans and Canadians and Mexicans. Lord, this is your heart. You brought Israel's Messiah for the world because you so love the world. Keep us, Lord, on track as this world is so divided and people are confused and people don't understand some of the history and the, of these conflicts. Lord, keep us centered in what Jesus is about. We ask it, Lord, for your glory and our greater joy. We ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said out loud together, amen, amen. Blessings on you. That was a lot. Congratulations for hanging in there. Next week, we're going into chapter 10. We'll see you then. God bless.